What I'm going to do now is to ha ask Eric Burnett just exactly how this manoeuvre takes place. How do they come in, Eric? The manoeuvre is quite complex in that initially they have to perform a retro burn uh, and subsequent to the retro burn or the re uh, reduce velocity uh, burn of the main engine they have to reorient the vehicle so that the crew can in fact actually see the landing site and use their indicator on the windshield um, for want of a better term uh, use the indicator on their viewer which has been calibrated to determine that they are in fact heading towards the correct la uh, landing site and that their vehicle attitude is mm. correct. At one stage during this critical maneuver they will in fact turn the vehicle over on its back so that they are looking out to the celestial sphere in fact and then they will start a pitch down maneuver which again brings the horizon and the landing site into view. Is this all automatically done? Yes, uh, provided that the primary guidance and navigation system or the backup abort guidance system are functioning correctly as they are at this moment then the maneuvers will be performed automatically by the, the computer on board the spacecraft. At what point do they take over themselves? They only take over manual control or semi-automatic control during the last 500 feet of the descent. Well now, I think now we're expecting ignition at any moment, so we'll listen to Houston talking to Eagle, that is the lunar module. Remember, by the way, that there is, it takes one and a quarter seconds for the radio signal to come to us. So we always have a delay of two and a half seconds when they sign out and come back to the other one. There's some nasty noises, but... Now this presumably is the actual burn taking place, the powered descent burn, which... It's very difficult to hear exactly what they're saying over all this noise. Do you know exactly what's going on here, Eric? At this stage, they should have... They should have performed the 10% thrust burn, or the ullage burn, in order to settle the propellants orient the motor through and they should now be in they should now be in the power descent phase Eagle, we got you now it's looking good over Eagle, that looks good Eagle, Houston, everything's looking good here over well, it sounds as though all's going well then they've done their 10% now, they can throttle this engine, can't they? Yes, indeed. Eagle Houston, after your round, angles, uh, S-band pitch, minus niner, y'all, plus one eight. So they're giving the figures of their actual orientation in space now, are they? Um, they were giving the figures for the orientation of the antenna in that last um, readout. Uh, the loss of signal almost certainly was due to the 10% thrusting of the engine causing some realignment of the lunar module. This is the antenna, of course, is the aerial, which has to be pointed precisely at Earth, and so they have to reorient this before they get the signal back. Yes, indeed, that is so. Now, this throttleable engine is something unique, isn't it, in rocket engines? Yes, it is indeed. And there is a very real problem, or has been a very real problem, in designing large engines, and this particular engine... 20 seconds, everything looking good. We show altitude about 47,000 feet. Well, yes. that's about right. The braking phase should start at 50,000 feet and extend over 300 miles. They're now at 47,000 feet coming in. Now, they're actually coming in here sideways, 
uh, firing their rocket backwards, so to speak, to slow them down, sitting down on their own exhaust, as I've heard it put. a little fluctuation in the uh, AC uh, voltage now. That is exactly Roger. what they are doing, the, uh, sitting on their own thrust from mm -hmm. the rocket engine, but they will now start pitching up. Now, they have a curious uh, nomenclature here that they talk about high gate and low gate. Now, high gate is about 7,600 feet up at a range of 26,000 feet. What is the significance of high gate here? The significance of the gate is that at the high gate, they activate the landing radar, and the landing radar provides one of the inputs to the guidance computer to ensure that they do come in at the correct velocity and also at the correct attitude to land at the selected landing site, at site two. Now this burn that's going on now, what is this? This is still a braking burn, essentially. They are still slowing down the spacecraft and correcting any small errors there may be in the approach velocity vector. Now, by now, they're probably down to about 35,000 feet, which is the height of VC-10 flies across the Atlantic, so they're really getting close. Yes, indeed, and uh, significantly, they will now be flying at a velocity comparable to that of a jet aircraft. They will be coming in at... You said you're go. You're batting at all at uh, 4 minutes. 350 to 400 knots. You go to continue power descent. You're go to continue power descent. So they're continuing with their power descent yes, now, indeed. all is well. Altitude 40,000. Well, they're just a bit above the VC-10 at the moment. Hey, yes. looking good. This all looks as though it's going very well, doesn't it? It's going very smoothly. Now, you've been deeply involved in this, Eric. Have you got your fingers crossed for this, or are you pretty confident? Very confident. Um, as confident as anyone can be. The extensive simulation, the success of Apollo mm -hmm. 9 and 10, uh, leads us to believe that this w will be a successful mission. Well, now we welcome listeners to the BBC World Service with the news that they're in their power descent phase. All seems to be going extremely well. Uh, I've got some uh, guests here, uh, Eric Burnett, Dr. Lionel Wilson, Dr. Freddie Latham, who are helping me in this commentary. And at the moment I'm talking to Eric Burnett, who was involved in the design of this equipment and knows quite a lot about it. So all seems to be going absolutely according to plan at the moment. Yes, indeed. Well, let's listen to them for a moment. Altitude now 33,500 feet. As I mentioned earlier, they are now using the landing radar to determine the altitude and to make any necessary velocity corrections. And as we get this news from NASA, we hear that the Russian Luna 15 is orbiting 10 miles from the moon's surface. Eric, what do you think it's there for? It is quite conceivable that it may be performing a photographic or a television mission um, and we may possibly have a transmission of the lunar walk. So you think that we may see something from this that you can't see from the actual equipment that the Americans have got there? Yes, indeed, this is a possibility. It is speculation, obviously, but it is a possibility. The orbit, the equatorial orbit, and the low altitude are consistent with a surveillance-type mission. Well, it all seems to be going well from the information we're getting over from Houston and from the astronauts, all going absolutely according to plan. Now, the, the time it takes for them to touch down from here is a matter of minutes, I suppose, is it? Yes, indeed. We are within five minutes of touchdown at this point. Altitude now 21,000 feet, still looking very good. So this is something like bringing in a helicopter, is it? Um... It is perhaps not quite so simple as that. But the basic handling of the spacecraft and the concepts are very analogous to those of a helicopter. Now, they will now rock this thing round and then sit down gently vertically. While they do this, they can't actually see where they're landing, can they? They lose sight of the landing site 
a few seconds before touchdown, but at this point in the mission, they in fact are pitching up the spacecraft. That is, they are turning their engine towards the lunar surface, ready for the hovering uh, mode. And during this pitch up, they can see the lunar horizon and they can look at the landing site and appraise the the possibilities and the problems they may encounter when they actually touch down on the site. And they still have the option at this moment and through the next few minutes to abort the mission at any point if they consider that a landing is unsafe. I just heard they're down to 500 miles an hour, so this is really getting close. Yes, indeed. Now, they've got this descent engine that is blowing downwards to slow them down. They've got some little squibs on the side as well to push it about, haven't they? Yes, they do indeed have some small thrusters, 100-pound thrusters, which do enable them to make slight changes in the vehicle attitude or position. Now, this hovering, how long could they hover there for? They have a, a total burn time of 700 seconds on the descent engine. And this gives them several hundred seconds during the hovering phase, perhaps as much as 300 seconds if they require this length of time. Mm -hmm. I suppose at the present moment that the stress on the population of the world listening to this is probably greater than that experienced by the trained astronaut. What do you think about that, Dr. Latham? I think that's very true indeed. Uh, these men have been trained to this experience, and the people who are listening to this have not been trained. And there must be many people listening who will have higher blood pressures than those of the astronauts. Now, uh, what do you think are the risks, say, compared with people like Lindbergh and Amy Johnson? I think the risks of this adventure are probably less than many of the uh, sophisticated sports on the world, motor car racing and so on. Mm. They will have calculated to far narrower limits here. Well, now, let's listen to what's going on, because we're coming really to the exciting moments. 540 feet down at 30, down at 15. Mere 500 feet from the surface at this moment. They're 400 feet down at 9. They have, now, pa they have now passed the low gate. 150 feet down at 4. 30, half down. Uh, on, uh, mm -hmm. down and this is Aldrin who's actually speaking, Buzz Aldrin from the Eagle. One and a half down. Seventy. Mm -hmm. At any moment now, they will actually be on the move. The final stage, they know where they are because they have 68-inch probes sticking out of the feet. And as soon as these probes, or one of them, touches the moon's surface, a light lights up on the control panel. The Neil Armstrong allows a second, switches off the engine, and the thing then gently settles down. They are now committed to the landing and have lost sight of the lunar surface. So they can't see what they're doing at all. They've just got to uh, wait for this information coming up from the probes. Now it's absolutely essential that they should land as near vertically as possible. If the angle at which they land is more than 15 degrees out of vertical, they just can't get off again. So this is a crucial moment.
Four forward. Four forward. Drift into the right a little. Ready? Down and a half. 30 seconds forward. Just well, this is rather like docking a ship, isn't it? They're bringing it in just as calmly and simply as that. Contact light. Okay, engine stop. APA at a descent. Boat control, both auto, descent engine command override off. Engine arm off. 413 is in. They have landed. We copy you down, Eagle. Houston, uh... They're in. And this is at 18 minutes past nine, or 2018 GMT. Well, that's marvelous. Down safe and sound. You're looking good here. Okay, we're gonna be busy for a minute. After I'm on, take care of the deep. I'll get this back prepared. Well, that must be the greatest moment in the mission. Down safe and sound. Now then, I wonder if we could find Reg Turnhill to see what's happening at Houston. No, we can't, apparently, at this moment. So, all is well. Now, I'd like to call in Dr. Lionel Wilson now. Um, you know a lot about the moon's surface here. What is it like where they've come down? Well, the area of uh, touchdown is in one of the uh, dark areas of the moon, the Maria. Um, the surface is generally flat and undulating. In the particular area for which they're aiming, there are three fairly large craters, uh, a diameter is perhaps half a mile, and otherwise, fortunately, there are no very intermediate-sized craters. Um, there are large numbers of depressions of perhaps one to five meters in diameter. And I think uh, the settling of the legs of the craft into a crater of this size will not produce too great a tilt. So that um, it's not absolutely crucial um, that the craft find a completely level spot. Uh, are there any dangers of them hitting boulders and so on here? Uh, they seem to have come down absolutely according to plan, and therefore uh, in the center of their prime target area there are likely to be very few boulders. There appears to be a field of boulders some little way to the east, but uh, they, uh, they seem to have avoided this area quite successfully. How long will it take the dust to settle? Well, the dust um, stirred up by the landing jets will, of course, not be supported by any atmosphere as it would be in the case of the Earth, there being no atmosphere on the Moon, and therefore the particles will settle out very quickly. Um, Dr. Latham, I'd like to ask you a question here. They're going into a rest period. Uh, do they need this at this stage? I mean, are they really tired out after this? No, I think they've had a fairly successful trip so far. They should be very fresh. And the decision is entirely theirs now whether or not they go for an early walk on the moon. Uh, we've been trying to guess what they might choose to do and the consensus of opinion here is that they might well carry out an early walk on the moon um, there's no reason why they shouldn't do if they've had plenty of rest beforehand now they are scheduled